Um, So good morning, everyone. I'm Tiffany and thank you for joining us this morning for the PRCA's Equity and Inclusion Advisory Council's first leadership lesson in 2022. I had to double check that I was wrote down 2022 because I still can't believe that we're there. Um, Our goal uh, within the Equity and Inclusion Advisory Council is to increase and retain the number of women in leadership across the communications and public affairs industry. And these leadership lessons in particular are to raise awareness of the barriers faced by women in our industry and to find ways through personal stories as well as practical guidance to overcome these in order to secure change. A small thing I'm sure you are all agreeing. So before I go any further, I wanted to introduce who we'll be speaking to today, which is Justine Duggan. Justine is Head of Public Affairs at the Octopus Group, so you will know companies like Octopus Investments and Octopus Energy that sit under this group. Prior to this, Justine worked at in-house communications, working with clients such as Sky, NHBC and Hyde Housing. And then prior to working in communication, she spent seven years in the House of Commons working for two separate MPs running their offices. The first question I wanted to ask JD, because I, I promised her I wouldn't go into her biog too much at the beginning, is just to talk, uh, to tell everyone listening kind of how you got to how you got to where you are um, and how authenticity played a role in that. So um, public affairs was never a dream of mine or something I ever thought I would end up doing. I left school at 18 with really bad GCSEs. Well, they weren't even GCSEs in those days. They were O-levels and uh, A-levels that you couldn't have gone anywhere with. Um, And somehow I managed to get a job as a, what would now be described as a, I suppose, an apprentice at the Daily Mirror. And... um, when I arrived there, it was terrifying. But the one thing I did learn was if you worked hard and you spoke up for yourself, you sort of got on and you were thrown in the deep end. Um, I ended up working in national newspapers for about mm, 10 years, going with various editors when they moved to different places. And then I ended up at the Sun newspaper working in the marketing department for a long time, had two children, started working on my local paper. And then through working on my local paper, met somebody called Brandon Lewis, who is now the Northern Ireland Secretary, worked for him before he was an MP and uh, ended up going into Parliament when he won his seat. And then the rest is history, as Tiff has just explained. So I ended up really by just an accident, ending up working in public affairs. But um, the one thing that I found over the years that I'm very good at is talking and chatting and networking. And uh, that is what public affairs is all about, is about making sure you can get your message across and meeting as many people as possible. So sort of found my niche in a very roundabout way. Being authentic, though, is something that, again, it's like, as I said, over the years, wherever I've worked, I've seen so many people trying to be somebody else. When I've worked in places um, where women have even, you know, taken up golf because they think if they play golf they're fitting with the men and can go on the trips and you know they think if they wear a certain you know corporate clothing that's what they're meant to be doing you know I've seen bad behavior because of it as well I've seen women that are told to you know portray themselves in a certain way and often the nature of women I think we're we're naturally a little bit kinder and we've got more time and I think often I've seen women think that they've got to bark orders um, to to get on and and be seen like this. And it it really causes some bad behaviour. And in my very first job, I saw this with a particular lady. And, you know, it made me really question, is that the right way to be? And I think that that's probably why I really care about people being themselves and not trying to be somebody else. You just you just touched on the next question I wanted to, to ask you and kind of why is why is being authentic important to you? And you touched on the fact that you, it's almost like reverse, not necessarily reverse psychology, but you see someone acting in a certain way and you determine that that's not how you want to be. But in terms of the jobs that you've had and where you are now, how, why is authenticity important? I think, first of all, it's the bad behaviour that I've seen sometimes when people are trying to be somebody else. Also, it, it, and it is exhausting, I think, for people when they're trying to be, you know, not their natural self it's so hard you know I do think at the same time you know some of our things we do need to work on we can't just be as we are I mean when I was younger I had a terrible temper you know you can't bring that into the office you have to modify it and I think there's things like that 
But for me, one of the main things as well is, as you probably can all hear, I have quite a strong uh, East End stroke Essex accent. And uh, other people go to me, oh, you know, it, it's fine. But it, every single job, even where I am now, people have mocked it. And it's made me really determined never to change it. And that's probably one of my main things. And it's one of my biggest bugbears is, you know, this way that often, and hopefully it's changing now, we hear more regional accents, thank goodness, now in Westminster. And we're hearing more regional accents in entrepreneurs and businesses as well. And I, I would like to hear more of that. And I don't think people should change. I once worked for an editor of a newspaper and um, the lady that sat next to me was a, a Liverpudlian and she had the most wonderful accent. It was just dreamy. And a particular uh, writer who's well known and I won't name them, phoned up and said to the editor, you must get rid of her. It's not appropriate for her to be working for you, answering your phone in an editor's office of a national newspaper. I was incensed by this. And it, it just made me so angry that somebody thought that that is okay to say and to be. And I think that's part of what is behind me, who I am and staying as who I am. Because if people don't like that about you, then you're not in the right place. You shouldn't have to change. Other people should accept everybody. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And we were, um, the uh, group we're talking about before we put on this lesson, like how the balance between authenticity and being yourself, but also particularly for women, constantly being told that you have to bring gravitas. And you were saying about touching on accents, that that is something that, that as the example you gave, that some people don't seem to think that you can be who you are and talk how you want to talk or talk how you do talk rather than just how you want to talk it and still have be, that gravitas. It can be an asset because people remember you and, you know, it makes you slightly distinct to other people in a workplace. I mean, I work at Octopus, which is an investment company um, and you know you stand out when you're on a call with other venture capital trust association people you know you're not the run of the mill and that's part of being authentic how would you particularly for for women the you've got gravitas on one side which i think if we ask anyone on this call close your eyes describe gravitas in three words i think we'd be all be pretty similar in what those words would be with being authentic because i think I mean, for, for audience members, I've known Justine for coming on to four, four years. And I think people on the call who do know me, there's certain things that they would expect me to do that wouldn't necessarily fit under that gravitas hat. I'm thinking particularly I'm a terrible, terrible person when it comes to swearing a lot. Um, so th things like that. How do you how do you marry being yourself whilst also trying to, particularly of women pushing for leadership roles and wanting to stay in those leadership roles to marry that? being yourself with having the gravitas that's required of you in a leadership position? I really hate the term and we are told as women, I've been told before, you know, to get on, you've got to, you know, portray yourself in a certain way. You've got to have gravitas. And I really hate it. I think that it's a horrible thing to say to women. Do they say that to men? I don't know. I mean, you know, probably we should poll that in all honesty. Um, but for me, you know, if, your work, if you work really hard and you're getting results, you don't need to have gravitas. You just need to make sure that you're letting people know what you've done. Um, and it's not so much standing there in a suit and high heels and full, face full of makeup. It's more, you know, actually you can see the results I've got because I've done this, this and this. This is where we've gone forward. And I've got a team that work with me that really like working with me. I don't think you need any more proof than that in this day and age. I just think that the idea of women having to prove themselves is just such a horrible thing these days. I just, it's just not necessary anymore. And I see women do it all the time. And that's where I see the bad behaviour. It's a, it's a really inter interesting point, particularly around, even I don't think I knew the term gravitas as much until I started working in, in public affairs, but also, frankly, authenticity in terms of, you know, it, it blew my mind that being yourself had a whole category of, of, you know, leadership qualities or qualities and particularly in communications. It's something that anyone who works in communications in any discipline is always told, you know, the best message is to be 
authentic like people will pay attention to you if you're authentic but I feel sometimes you know um I was talking to someone and they asked a question about uh, Adam Grant wrote an article a while ago about being yourself is only a good idea if you're Oprah which is a, it's really difficult because obviously that is that is Oprah's niche is the fact that she's you know unashamed to be herself as she should be um but for the rest of us how how do you think we can bring that authenticity and integrity to the to the work that we do without going down the bad behavior and pretend gravitas route i read that adam grant article and i disagreed with all of it because i think that everybody is unique everybody has some quirk everybody has something interesting and i think the working from home thing i think people have become more relaxed as well and are more open to showing their personalities through you know maybe it's their backdrop of their books or things they may collect and it starts to show people's personality as well as you know what you'd normally meet and I think that people's quirks are what make them different and I think people if we're all the same and you don't let weaknesses show I just don't think it makes good for collaborative working either it, it's it's that thing where, you know, we all know what we're good at and we know what we're bad at. And if we don't, you'll certainly learn as you go on through your career. And if you're open to the other people you work with, then they're open too. And you find the people that are better at things than you. I'm not the best at writing, but you can put me in a room of people I don't know and I would be in my element. Whereas the person that's good at writing probably would hate to be put in that room. And that's where you start to draw out the skills and the way that we're all so different. And that's how I think you make the best teams and move forward. I just don't think hiding your little quirks is a good thing at all, because it's exhausting. That is true. Do you think that working from home, I mean, we're getting to the point where obviously government guidance is, you don't have to work from home anymore. We've been nearly two years into a pandemic. Do you think that the working from home over this time, but also moving into the world of proper hybrid working full stop will change how people can be Authentic. So, for example, you talked about backdrops and and people being able to bring their quirks. Obviously, it's so different. Even this interaction is different to if we were doing this in in person or you know going for a coffee or something. So, do you think it's easier to bring your authentic self to work, or do you think that people that would potentially be less enthusiastic about doing that have managed have, well have adapted because of working from home? I think it's I think it's easy to bring your authentic self to work during the pandemic if you've worked at that company for a while or worked with those people. I think for your first interactions or if you're new to a company, that would be very hard because people don't know you and you want to make that good impression. Um, it's a bit like going for an interview. You're not going to turn up in a crazy outfit, but give it a couple of weeks down the line. You can start to bring your personality into work. You do. So I think for people that are already established in where they work and their workplace, it's been quite a nice way for people. They've dressed down, you know, women haven't worn makeup so much. They've, you know, had a backdrop. There's people's cats that have walked across the screen. So you've started to learn a bit more. Oh, they've got a pet. Oh, I didn't know that. Or, oh, and they've had children playing recorders in the background that people have seen. You've started to learn a lot more about people. And I think that's been quite nice especially at the beginning for um, women to see men having to juggle children, which is a bit stereotypical of me to say, but being a mum myself, I think it was quite nice to see that authenticity in men as well, that actually, you know, you're having this call and there's two children having a big fight over in the corner, these two boys. That's something that you don't see. And I think that's been quite nice for people to open up a little bit like that. But I think if you started a new job, then I think that's going to be very hard to be able to let your personality come through because you're just not going to feel comfortable. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. I will go into a bit more detail, hopefully later on in our in our chat about what particularly men can do in the industry to, to help and support women, but also just broadly. Um, but what given everything you've said, what advice would you give yourself at the start of your career? So if you could go back to 18 year old Justine post O-levels what would you what advice would you give yourself network just oh my god the people I met when I worked at Mirror and the Sun and the News of the World and then at the Express they have popped up time and time again in my career like I wouldn't believe I mean it's crazy and sometimes 
there's people that I did know very well that lost touch, uh, lost touch with. And I think, oh my God, you know, if I still stayed in touch with those people, that would be so easy to reach this person, that person. So definitely network. The other thing is read more. If ever you're in a situation and you feel a little bit uncomfortable or you, you know, you might not know something, if you've well read in a topic, and I found obviously po politics wasn't my dream goal. So I've never studied it at school, never, you know, obviously knew the general stuff. But, you know, in latter years, I've spent time with Andrew Moore at Modern Britain on the uh, car radio and, you know, just spent time reading, listening to anything historical because it just has helped so much to form, you know, your opinions. And when you're in situations, it just helps because you just know you've got something to pull from. Um, don't ever miss the opportunity to learn from your colleagues, whoever they are, old, young, anything. Everybody's got something that you can learn from. And I think sometimes maybe I didn't listen enough when I was younger and I should have. Learn from bosses, especially bad bosses. They are brilliant to learn from. Embrace them because they will teach you so much about yourself. They will make you resilient you will learn how to not be a bad boss as well. And that to me is a big thing is don't, you know, when you get, and we all get them, just embrace it, try and just embrace it and think that's just how they are. It's not with me and learn from it because I think that is something that I wish I'd have taken a little bit more time to understand why other people act the way they do and push yourself as well. And if you're not comfortable pushing yourself, find somebody that you're happy to talk to and they will help you. Like, it doesn't even need to be a mentor, it can be a friend, but they need to really work in the same industry as you, I think, so they can understand what you're talking about. But if you can find a friend that you trust and you can say, look, I'm thinking of doing this, what do you think? And they're happy to talk to you. Then that, without a doubt, I think I could have moved forward a lot faster in my career if I'd have found some people that I now use to talk things through. Um, so that would be another thing. Another thing as well is work hard. I mean, it says, it, it just do, just keep going, never give up, just keep going. There's always a way to do things. And the one thing that I have embraced later in my career, which is invaluable, is take feedback. You may not like it, but you will learn so much from it and ask people for feedback um, much more than you probably do. It's really, really helpful. At Octopus, they are crazy for feedback and it is just changed the way I work. Um, it really is something that if your company do not do it, try and get them to put a culture in of giving feedback to people, whether it's good or bad, but as long as it's constructive, because that's just not helpful if it's just mean, but it really, really can help people. I can, I completely agree. I think yes, it was. I could probably go on, Tiff, but that's a good list of things. No, it's this. So you definitely putting, say. Putting the lesson in leadership lesson. No, it's and feedback. I definitely. I mean, I agree with everything you just said. Um, but feedback in particular, there's someone on, from my team is on the call, and I know that they'll be banging their head against the desk. And I always say that feedback is a gift. And I always say, I think it was from uh, being on the common at Octopus that that taught me that. It's, as you said, it doesn't matter whether it's negative positive as long as it's constructive it's always helpful to to, exactly. to use yeah, and to networking is just the key it's just so important you you just in an industry especially like public <coughs> affairs the same people will be around for a very long time um and you just they just can learn so much from people and they always know somebody that you might want to know i mean my first boss at the mirror and that was 32 years ago we still go to lunch every Christmas and that's 32 years of staying in touch with her. And she was the editor of the newspaper then. And uh, she's probably more, more well known these days for being Claudia Winkleman's mother, but um, she is invaluable to me still 32 years on. So, you know, don't lose your contacts with these people that you work with because they're invaluable to you as you carry on. And they're always there for advice. I would also say on the, on the networking point, just to, to come in on it is that, networking as a word particularly when I first joined I was terrified of it I was as you said like we're very different you would walk into a room 
with a bunch of strangers and being your element I am the complete opposite and I think networking has such a has certain connotations to, to different people but at its basic level it just means meeting people it doesn't have to be in a big room it can be one-on-one -on -one, meeting people getting to know them sharing information that might be helpful and nine times out of ten becoming friends not always and that's absolutely fine you can have professional contacts without you know adding them to your Christmas card list but just the you know as a word it shouldn't be as scary as it is but I mean it's still something that fills me slightly with dread even though I've been doing it for for years and years um so in terms of we talked before about how we get more women into the industry but also the most important thing is keep keeping them in the industry and also helping them progress to um leadership roles and I say helping them I don't mean because women need help and men don't I just mean in terms of we physically see far more men in leadership positions than we do women and particularly I think I wanted to ask you from a public affairs point of view having worked in both comms politics and public affairs more women go into comms than men broadly but that's not the case in public affairs so why do you think that is and how can we tackle encouraging more women into public affairs and also keeping them there <laughs> about this hard and I think the first thing I think is we just need to teach politics in school from a younger age um, I think that a lot of people pick it as an A-level subject um, and don't really know what they're going to learn um, but I think it's quite popular in schools at that age and I think that quite a lot of girls do it but it's not taught at all really uh, uh, in the younger age group they're taught environment and you know link it that way but and school councils but I don't think it's really you know the other thing that I think there's a big problem with is how do we reach the younger generation because obviously when I was younger it was newspapers and you would pick up a newspaper whether it was on the table in the kitchen or you'd get one on the train you didn't have any way other than the news at 10 or you know news at lunchtime or breakfast to, to get the information and politics at the minute is often you know we see these sound bites or twitter and you don't get enough information people jump straight to oh that mp's voted that way that's terrible but there needs to be an understanding of why they voted that way how it, how government works how the parties work you can't do that on you know snapchat and it just doesn't work on tiktok and all these other places where it's where it is so I do think that's another problem is how we're going to reach people um I think that the things that are good is that we are seeing some authentic women MPs coming through now um Tracy Crouch I think is a great advocate especially in the sports world for for girls to see we've got Jess Phillips who you know has opened the world of politics to many many more young women um Angela Rayner as well couldn't be more authentic if she tried um, they really are, you know, we're, we're getting to see these role models now and they are appearing more in magazines and we're seeing even magazines, you know, high-end ones such as Vogue that are starting to feature interviews with Nicola Sturgeon and these type of people, which I just think we need to see a little bit more of that. Um, and we need, we are doing really well, actually. I shouldn't say we need more, but political journalists has changed over the last few years. We're seeing more and more female political journalists which I think is a great thing so yeah for me it, it's more about how do we reach the younger young generation and, and let them know that there are jobs in public affairs for women because as you say there's just not many women around doing public affairs um, and I think we need to show that there is this path there there is this career path and I don't think it's shown very much at school even um, and I think that probably is where we need to start work yeah. and yeah I think the more role models we can have of the Jess Phillips that we can push out their messages then the better yeah no and again going back to networking just I think one of the first the very first event I went to when I was in when I moved down to London in public affairs was a PRCA event um, back before the Public Affairs Board was was part of it, and it was their Public Affairs Group. And I think there were a, a few a few women in the room at the time. But thankfully, all of those events now you see far more. Um, but it is, I think, having those networks and recognizing people, going, being able to to talk to them. 
in terms of how do you think we if you could have if you could say one thing about what we as an industry can do to make it more sustainable for women to to stay and but more importantly to progress and um, so from your own point obviously you came into came into octopus after you'd worked an agency and are now head of public affairs like what do you think the broader industry can do to make it more sustainable for women to to progress i think we need to work together more as women is my honest opinion as well um we don't by nature hang around pubs women standing outside especially in winter because it's flipping freezing standing outside the red line what person in their right mind would want to do that <laughs> the boys do and they do it a lot and i think that we need to find ways to network together i'm a member of the parliamentary women's football team um they've let me stay there because the agency I work for at the time set the team up so I'm allowed to stay work stay playing and that is such a good way of networking it was never set up for networking but it's such a great bunch of women and I think it's across all parties and public affairs people and it, it really has changed a lot of ways people feel about each other and it's a really nice group and I think we need as public affairs women to find other routes to network and I think that the more we can do it the better and we will keep people in the industry longer that way because you can share your problems and thoughts about things and I think that's what um, we need to do a lot better. That's that's really helpful what do you think we, we touched on this briefly and I will stop asking you questions in a minute and ask uh, ask people listening if they have any questions but it always it's one of the, the kind of bugbears of, of mine when it comes to people talking about women in the industry is that largely if, particularly in an industry that's dominated by men to to get change you're going to have to bring men on board and I don't think thankfully in 2022 we're in the position where we have to explain why having more women in a company is good I think thankfully we're we're past that stage but I still think there's a there's a needs to be a bigger emphasis on men and their role within a within a company so have you experienced any have there been any male role models that you found have been supportive of you in your career or as you said if there if there weren't those have you learned things from from men not behaving in that way that you can then say as, as advice have, going forward I've had the most amazing boss when I worked at the Sun newspaper group um his name was Ellis Watson he was crazy, but his behaviour was amazing. He knew everybody from the club to Rupert Murdoch and treated them all exactly the same. Every element of that day was, and you couldn't, anyone in his team, and there's 12 of us that are still friends, and we're actually going to stay with him in March and haven't worked, we haven't worked together since 1997, I think. He made every single day fun. He was the most amazing role model, believed in women, unbelievably. His whole team, bar two, were men, and he really didn't even want those two men. He preferred the women. He pushed everybody. He helped one lady with an exchange to the New York Times. I mean, he couldn't have been more of a champion, and uh, that was quite early on in my career when I just, yeah, he was amazing, just one of the best people. And then public affairs wise, is there guys that I've worked with that I admire? I should be able to answer this quicker, shouldn't I? But um, no, I can't actually, Tiff, which is a terrible thing to say, really, isn't it? It's 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 easier said than done. It's easier when you when you ask a ask a question. Um, in which case, I'm gonna throw it. There are, I'm sure, a few questions, and I hope I haven't taken everybody's everybody's questions that they they may have had so if anyone wants to ask I think you should be able to ask directly um but if you want to put in the chat that you want to ask and then I can can invite you to do so if that's the easiest way Suda you just appeared appeared on my screen so does that mean that you have a question oh you know no I have a couple more does anybody have any questions so it helps if I look at the right chat box it's open doesn't it we've done a whistle stop tour clearly jd we've we've answered we've answered every laura hi 
Uh, it's really great to join. I'm sorry I didn't make it for the first part, but I, and I apologise therefore if my question's already been covered. But you touched there on how important it is to have champions. I've certainly found that during my career as well, and how much difference that makes. You know, for people who don't automatically have somebody like that in their workplace or their kind of life, how how would you suggest, or how have you found it helpful to go around finding those types of people? You know, how have you found your champions, mentors throughout the course of your career? They've tended to be people that have either worked with me or met them through friends even, which is a real strange thing to say. But a lot of the people that I would say are my champions is, I mean, hate to say it, but Tiff and me have quite a close relationship and would call on each other to test out ideas and thoughts. But I have lots of people that have also, you know, I've worked with. But if you didn't have anybody, then maybe this is the forum that we start to buddy people up to. If I don't know, is that something that you would think about doing? I, I, Give me two seconds. Lisa, if you can hear me, can you put yourself on mute, please? Perfect, thank you. So Sorry. maybe we maybe Laura, I'm putting this to Tiff here. Maybe that's something that she could offer or PRCA could do a list, you know, have a group of people that are willing to, you know, maybe buddy up or chat about this a bit further. Because I've found it invaluable when you find someone who understands what you're doing and you can just run ideas by them and they may have an experience or they may say, no, go for it, you know, and, and you may just want to talk about it as you go along or your fears or what you're worried about, but you might not want to do it to, you know, people within the same organisation. And I've found that really helpful. Yeah, that's a really good idea. We'll take it. Um, there's various different networks and things that are having something that is a, almost kind of, as you said, not necessarily mentoring as, as a long term relationship, but that kind of sounding board or advice on a on a more regular basis. Suda. Yeah. Uh, so I'm ready with my question and uh, thank you Justine for that wonderful talk and thank you Tiffany for managing so well facilitating it so well um, so uh, like you mentioned you know networking is such an important part of where you find yourself in life and in your career and your networks of you know people who support you but there are lots of people including me who actually didn't spend any time networking for the first 25 years of my life because I was too busy working and looking after my young family. And uh, that it, it was a terrible thing, but there are lots of people like me. What happens to those? How do you build those networks? Um, I know with the with uh, the PRCA, EIAC and the work that the gender work stream is doing, we're trying to enable that. And you um, said something brilliant. And I think Tiffany, we must think about it, you know, how to create a body system where people can chat, et cetera. But I think, how do you, break into those networks when you've never done it before and you could be an older person like me you oh, oh don't worry about age i'm an older person i've got two children i was a single mum, so i know exactly what you mean but i the easiest way um, especially public affairs is hopefully we're going to start to go back to in-person events and a lot of the think tanks often do talks on various policy things they launch policy papers those places are really good place to start because they want people at those events. So that's great. And when you're there, you'll end up sitting next to somebody like me or Tiff and you can just introduce who you are, what you do. In the days of a business card, you swap a business card. I don't know if people are going to start swapping those again. And that is it. It's as simple as that. And then you'll go to the next event two months later and you'll see our face again. And you're like, oh, there's so-and-so. And you go and chat and it's just... It really is easy, even if you don't really like it, you just need to sit and talk to whoever and you just bump into them. And once you start doing this a few times, you'll see the same faces at the same things and you just start to talk to different people. I think on a on your own to something, then again, if we had this buddy thing that I'm now giving Tiff work for, <laughs> is anybody yeah. else going to this this evening? Because it would be nice if I could walk in with somebody else. I think Absolutely. I completely agree. The one thing I would say as well, particularly Sula, as you were saying, being being busy and juggling home life with work life is make the most of your work time if you can. Like if you've got the, the ability to do something work related that involves networking, but also if you know one person and you know that they're 
they know someone else and you just wanted a 15 minute chat about something you're doing with work i still count that as as networking and i think that's it's the, the bite-sized chunks if you are trying to do so many different things that makes it so so much easier than that kind of oh my god there's an event for two and a half hours how on earth am i going to fit that into my into my schedule and particularly if it goes over you know bath time or putting the kids to bed it's, like, it, it's not and that's another thing i think as an industry we can do is make sure we do events at different times <laughs> um for different different people um and that's also where i think virtual events come in as well i'm just going to read laura's question as well in terms of going to those networking events jd how can people who feel a bit rusty about engaging in person boost their confidence particularly as we've all been you know i said to you i'm far more comfortable looking into a camera and a screen now than i think i ever ever was um but how how would you advise people going back to in-person meetings and networking events and things definitely think networking things find someone to go with you if you're feeling a bit like that because it, it, that, even I don't really like walking into somewhere on my but you sort of know once you're in there you'll find somebody and you'll have a chat and then hopefully you know you'll see a familiar face and it's all fine but if it's not something you're comfortable with then you know find someone else to go with is the first thing because you'll just feel at ease as soon as you get there to boost confidence, I think you're just going to have to throw yourself in as, back into this because we're not going to we're not going to be on Zoom forever. Hopefully, I say I've said that probably so many times over the last two years, but I do think you're just going to have to bite the bullet and go back to it. And I think a lot of people are going to feel the same. Remember, that's the other thing. I don't think anybody that's feeling nervous about going back to networking is going to be the only person that's feeling like that. I think a lot of people are going to be oh, here we go, you know, what's this going to be like? Who's going to be here? What have I got to say? I haven't done anything for the last two years. You know, everybody's going to be the same. I think people are going to be pleased to see people in person again like, once you get there. But I would honestly say if people are nervous, find someone else to go with you because you'll just feel better immediately. What what tips would you have then once you're there about being authentic? Because it's, you talked before, particularly of working from home, once you get to know people, being authentic is so much easier. But when you first meet people, it's really difficult. I just watched, uh, I don't know if anyone's watched Afterlife, but I just watched an episode last night when someone pretends to be a doctor and they're not on a first date. And it's that kind of, it's that kind of thing. Obviously you don't want to pretend to be in a completely different job, but how do you, how do you make sure you bring your kind of authentic self to networking events where you might only have a minute and a half of, of talking to somebody? Well, I suppose it would depend what the event is as well, Tiff, from why you're there. But before you go, I think probably I would, normally think about a couple of things that I might ask somebody um, not prepare but I mean if I knew exactly who was going to be there then yes I'd probably have a couple of targets I'd want to reach and know what I was going to ask them um, so yeah just have a little think about what the event is why you're there yourself as well um, if it's just to meet people then think of a couple of things that you might want to ask them about the event that's happening um, and just do a little bit of prep as well you know, the people that are holding the event, you know, who's going to be on the panel? What have they done before? Have you got anything in common with them? And then you can always think about catching people and asking them. I think asking questions is a really good point. The amount of times, especially if you're nervous, you end up talking a lot about either yourself or you spend two minutes talking about something you could have covered in 30 seconds and then you feel that you haven't given them the opportunity to speak. Not that I'm, you know, saying that networking and dating are similar, but, it, they, you know, they're similar similar kind of concepts when we're... And this we're is, I think, this is different. where I think men are better at they will often look at a round table of you know six people and they will look into who these are and what they might ask these people they think about it a lot more than women do because i think we just naturally think oh we just have a chat and then we think oh gosh not really prepared for this so i think that yeah that is something that we should definitely you should look at who's going to be there and see if you can think of a few things you might want to ask them yeah no that's a very good point I don't, don't think I can get away with my awkward networking starter, which is always to loiter by the food or the drink. Um, because nine, nine times out of 10, someone's going to want some drink or, <laughs> or some food and you're uh, more likely to meet someone there than the kind of beelining for someone in a room. I always find that quite uncomfortable. There's time for one more question, I think. So I'm going to wait to see if anyone either puts up their hand, which is much better Zoom etiquette than, than I've had previously, or to write in the chat. David has his hand up, Tiff. Ah, oh, thank you. I can't see that. Sorry. Sorry, David. Coming to you. <laughs> That's all right. Um, 
I, I just wanted to pick up on the um, point about gravitas earlier. Um, I, I suppose kind of as a man, I could definitely say that, yeah, uh, there is an idea of gravitas that men should also have. And it, I'm it's, pleased it's, about it's, that. It's probably also the same kind of one that is almost kind of impersonal and, you know, suit and tie and that kind of particular image. Um, I just wondered whether you had any thoughts on why, well, I suppose where that idea came about and actually why it is even still in existence. Because um, to me, I, I yeah, I, I, think I, that, I don't understand it. No, I don't understand it. And I think that when I first started work, women dressed in a certain way and men were very you know, suit and tie, and you still see that quite a lot now, especially around Westminster where we were, you know, if anybody's going to meet an MP, invariably they would, you know, put on a suit and tie and, you know, you dress that way. I don't know why it's there. I think it's something that we need to get rid of, in my opinion. I think there's a time to be smart, obviously, and you're not going to turn up looking a scruff bag, but I don't think that it means just because you're in a suit and tie and I'm in a you know, pencil skirt and a jacket and high heels, I'm going to be better at my job. To be honest, I'd be grumpy all day. I'd be much worse at my job if I had to wear that. Um, and I think that's something that hopefully companies will start to break down a bit. And maybe after the pandemic, we may find people are a bit more casually dressed as well. After being at home for so long, you know, suddenly putting on a suit is going to feel really uncomfortable for people. Um, so I'd like to think that that barrier's broke down. But there are a time and place for... Um, dressing a bit quirky, which I'm a big, uh, I'm full foul of. And I'll tell you this funny story. I was working for an MP and um, I had a call from the foreign office saying they needed to brief me because um, there was a certain situation that they needed to and the person I worked for was not around. I looked at what I had on this day and I had on a dress with a fox's face on the front, a pair of like, snow boots I'd describe them as, a woolly hat and a furry coat. Like there was nothing good about this look. And I just looked at myself and thought, I can't go to the foreign office like this. I was like, I was like scrabbling around. What can I do? So yeah, there's a time and a place still where you can't just, you know, turn up looking like that. And that was a bad day for me. But I do think that, you know, relaxed dressing needs to come more into the workplace. I mean, at Octopus it is, you know, we, you don't have to turn up in a suit and tie. They expect you to know when you need to wear that sort of clothing. Um, and I think we need more of it. And I was pleased to hear that men have the gravitas thing as well. It's not just a women talk. Because um, I do find it a little bit old fashioned and I don't think we need to have it anymore. I know what you mean. It's a bit jarring, isn't it? Yes. Um, we have one final question. Um, so I'm going to go to Fraser and then I'm going to wrap up afterwards to make sure that everyone has time to get their midday coffee. Thanks. Sir. And thanks, JD. It's been really interesting listening to you this morning. Um, I was interested, uh, it sort of builds on the last question about what it is that workplaces can do, and particularly people who have got um, people within teams that they're responsible for to encourage them to be authentic, um, particularly when they're, they're relatively new to the sector or, or new to work. Um, what is it that you think works best to help people feel confident enough to be authentic? First of all, and I said, I'm really, you've got to be authentic, Fraser, is the first thing. So they see that it's okay to be authentic. And if you as bosses are not authentic, they're not going to want to be it either. So that's the first thing is you've got to be authentic. Um, and that is one thing that even like here, I don't have a team here, but I work very closely with all the marketing team. And I have found that a lot of the younger members will be really open with me. Um, and I think it's because they know I say, oh, I, you know, I don't know about that, or I can do that, or I can help with this. It's just, you've got to be really authentic as bosses. And then they know that it's okay to be that. That's my first point. And the other thing is, you know, this feedback thing as well. You know, you can, you can give people feedback without upsetting them. I've seen it done here. It is amazing how people can come on from that and they can grow in confidence, which is the other thing. They need confidence and think that if they're seeing, you know, they're doing well, it's okay to be themselves as well, uh, then that is the key for me. Yeah, 
And Suda just put in the chat, and it's such a good point about seeing people like themselves being authentic. And also the key thing is not just being authentic, but succeeding in doing so. Because you can be, yeah. you know, you can be as authentic as you like, but if, if you're not getting on well <laughs> in a certain um certain area, it, it needs to be able to see that that kind of success and how it how it plays into that. Um, so that is a really good point. And that has brought us bang on to time, which I never thought with uh, myself and JD talking that we would be able to do. Um, so I just wanted to say to everyone, thank you very much for, for tuning in. We're going to take some of the ideas that JD has suggested, uh, pair them with some that Kathy uh, suggested uh, late last year and keep going on the leadership lessons. So please keep coming back and listening to our incredible female leaders that we have. Um, and thank you very much, Justine, for your for your time. Thank you. And uh, if there's anything to fucking do to help on this budding up thing or anything, I'd love to be involved. Thank you. Well, you've set yourself up now. So <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.